What did Einstein do mm -hmm. in 1905? And by, the dude was 26 years old yeah. when this happened. Go for it. So he writes a series of papers, all of which completely knock the world on its proverbial arse. Each arts. one. Each, yes, each on its, one. On its anus, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's Latin for that. Um, <laughs> on its mirabolous anus. So, yes, right. that's Gosh, my, uh, okay, my, so, my dating profile name. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see, what are they? Photoelectric effect. Yes, which? which? Uh, the photoelectric effect was the idea that sometimes light behaved like a particle and not a wave. And so sometimes when you bombard a surface with light, it will knock it like a basketball might dislodge something from place, as opposed to accumulating energy like a wave might. And so it really was very shocking. So in was terms that the of, first demonstration that light could be I also think, referenced as particles? Yeah, it was the first observation, connection between theory and observation, gotcha. that mm -hmm. it is actually behaving like a particle sometimes. Gotcha. Very mm -hmm. shocking, because because 18, hundreds we thought of light as a wave and we often still do because it's very convenient yeah. to do so sometimes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and sometimes it's acting like a wave yeah yeah um but here was an instance where it really acted more like you threw a basketball at something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um a really tiny basketball a really tiny <laughs> which was basketball. incredible for einstein to observe because basketball hadn't been invented yet <laughs> yes. right and i somehow don't see him i don't know jiving with the sports analogy but anyway so photoelectric effect shocker paper one paper two paper two um special relativity where he Oh, just has, that. Just <laughs> that. So a lot of times, so the theory of relativity became this real colloquial thing. Everything's relative and it became invest in society. I often say it could have been called the theory of absolutism because what Einstein really had done is he had adhered to the absolute limit of the speed of light. He took that more seriously than anybody else was taking it at the time. In fact, people were, were struggling to get rid of it. Uh, this idea that the speed of light was a constant. And they were doing everything they can to dethrone that concept, which really wasn't taking Wait, hold. So it's not just that it's a constant. It's that it's a constant no matter how, when, or where you measure it. Absolutely. You're getting the same answer. That's right. Even if you're moving right. and the light is moving relative to you, you measure the same speed of light. Right. Which, which is, doesn't exist for anything else. That's insane. Yeah. That it was right. an it, insane it's, concept. It's Two cars coming at each other are coming at each other faster than if one of the cars stops. Right. Okay, but that is not true at the speed of light. You run at the speed of light, maybe you're running slowly, maybe you're running near the speed of light yourself. It's still coming at you at the speed of light. Right. Mm -hmm. It is chilling, strange, seems impossible. So I think a simpler example is I'm on the front of a train, let's say the train <laughs> goes 60 miles an hour, okay. and I throw a ball 40 miles an hour. Can I throw that fast? Probably not. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I know I definitely can. I, I, I think you can do anything, Neil. I can do anything. I think you can do so anything. I, I throw 40 miles an hour in front of the train. You're standing on, at the platform, how fast is the ball passing you? Ding, ding, ding. Right, and is it not adding the two up? Yeah, yeah. It, it, so I mean, it's 100 miles. 100 miles an hour. Should right, be, cool. I mean, that was it, common experience. But if I'm on experience. the front of the train. I mean, I'm not calculating the speed. I'm worried that Neil deGrasse Tyson's on the top of a train <laughs> <laughs> throwing the ball, I'm very confused. So, so now I'm on the same 60 mile an hour train, I shine a beam of light, and you measure the beam of light going by you, it is the same speed of light. It does, we don't add the train. We don't add the train. We don't add the train. That's crazy. That, that's yeah. bat shit crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. And Einstein meditated on this for so long. And there's kind of a simple way to see. He, he said, well, you know, what is speed? It's, it's the distance you cover in space divided by the time elapsed. So it has to do with space and time. I mean, <clears throat> I mean that's a hugely by ready. And he said, I'd rather that your measures of space and time are relative then give up the absolute nature of the speed of light. Wow. So, two so your very measuring stick changes. Changes. Right. Relative to the so other observer. So that you get the same answer. So that you get the same answer. That's, 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 yeah. not the measuring stick and your rate the time ticks. That That's crazy. I mean, I still get chills yes, a little bit. So he's, what, which drug is he on? I know. <laughs> is it opium? What was is available it ether? at the time? Ether. He's not doing ketamine shots. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, give me more. So that's two. Um, brownie in motion. Talk about, give me some brownie in motion. So if you I mean, I think look, that feels like a dirty topic. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if that's appropriate for this. <laughs> oh, actually, I'm not, I bet Neil knows why it was called brownie. There's a, there's a guy. There's a guy first, who, was, who first, first talked about the statistical, it, but, right. Observed it, but yeah. didn't fully understand it. Right. Mr. So Brown. Mr. We've Brown. We've all observed it. So you go to a window, the dustier the house, the better. You pull the curtains aside and you start to see all the particles move around. They don't fall like rain. They bounce around the dust in the particles, air, the yeah. dust particles. Mm -hmm. And you can see the reflection of the dust in the air. You know, it's a, kind of a beautiful image, the sunlight hitting 
uh, reflecting off the dust of an particles. Of undusted apartment. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. of grandma's. My OCD is like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Clean that. Yeah, why have so, you let it go so long? <laughs> so, but we all have had that observation, and we all know it yeah. doesn't fall like rain. Mm-hmm. So Einstein also relates this to the quantum nature of matter. He says, fundamentally, air is not a continuum. If I look at it at the microscopic level, I'm going to realize it's made up of individual molecules, and the molecules are moving randomly because they're knocking into each other. They're bouncing around. He called that Brownian motion. So they bounce around randomly because they're kind of constantly knocking it, banging into each other as they move around. And um, it was more evidence for the quantum nature of, of reality in very early years. In fact, years. I think it was one of the first supportive bits of evidence that atoms even exist. That's right. Because you yeah. can, if you, in other words, you can have a big, you use the air mm-hmm. uh, dust analogy, but in a, in a, in a liquid solution, mm-hmm. uh, if you have a, a suspended particle that's larger than the molecules themselves, the particle sort of moves around Mm. in response to the collective energy of all Mm -hmm. the particles that are around it. And you can calculate Mm -hmm. what should happen if this liquid is composed of these tiny particles. And then you only get this motion when you have atoms doing the constant yeah, absolutely. Uh, agitating. And, and we talk Jostling, about, that's a better yeah, word. Yeah. We, we talk about the temperature in the room all the time, but what that really is is the average of the thermal motions of an awful lot of particles. Yeah. And the statistical behavior later very well predicted by Planck. And so this was all part of that early era of starting to understand that if I look at a glass of water, it is not a continuum. If I get small enough, it is actually made up of individual right. molecules. So, and there was in the fourth paper, wasn't there? Um, e equals mc squared. Oh, okay. That's a pretty good one. <laughs> okay, yeah, how can I forget um, about that one? Which, yeah, yeah. Which to some extent- That was the whole paper, you just wrote e equals mc squared. E equals mc Cement. squared. <laughs> Mic yeah. drop. This has been it's, a busy year. Except they didn't have mics then. But yeah. the drop, he dro- totally. fit, find just, something to drop. Totally, just get a, a, a right. speaker. One right. of those, uh, refrigerator drop. He was working in a patent office, right? Refining things like refrigerator okay. coolants and refrigerator cooling mechanisms. And at the bottom drawer of his desk, he had what he called the physics department. And in the physics department, he was working on these papers between refining people's patents. And E equals MC squared is one of the most gorgeous results, obviously, most famous equation. Obviously, we all love this result. And the implications of it went so far beyond his initial motivation for thinking about it. But That's the point of this whole so far beyond. episode. I mean, it's changed the world as we know it in so many ways. But Okay, so was, of those four yeah. results, yeah. two of them mm-hmm. were stapled together for the one Nobel Prize that mm. he got. Brownian and photoelectric. Correct, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And the, so he's got one Nobel Prize. Mm-hmm. For two things that and hard, not for E equals MC squared, and not for E equals MC squared, <laughs> not <laughs> for relativity, let okay. alone general relativity, right. which comes eleven years later. Right. So, mm-hmm. for me, what's intriguing is his Nobel Prize is some of the least interesting work right. that he's done. <laughs> <laughs> it was somebody wins a Grammy for their well, worst album. <laughs> well, it was practical. It was practical. The Nobel was always very attached to verifiable results. So it was very hard for Stephen Hawking to get nominated for a Nobel Prize. It was surprising to me that even Roger Penrose not only was nominated, but was awarded the Nobel Prize because they were so theoretical. And the Nobel Prize is often awarded for things that have been verified by experiment, not a minute before. Certainly in the day. That's the intention. That's correct. That's correct. Because it was the idea that if you're, if it's a theoretical result, could could go with the winds. Right. You know? right. Whereas you have, if you anchor it in an experiment... But. And then we, we got we got legit. You become legit. So so <laughs> let's, he did this all at twenty six. By the time mm-hmm. he turned twenty six, mm-hmm. yeah. It, it, I'm thirty eight, so this is very demotivating. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Sorry, what's your, I'm tw- I'm what is your mommy saying? <laughs> Thank you.